Uh, Andrew, uh, welcome, and uh, please, uh, uh, you, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, Th thank you very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm in London um, at the offices of the Service Prosecuting Authority, which is the organization uh, responsible for prosecuting members of the British Armed Forces for the most serious crimes, so members of the Army, Navy and Air Force. Um, so that's the job I've been doing for the last seven years. Uh, but prior to that time, I was prosecuting and defending uh, within the international courts. Um, I was the international co-prosecutor at the Khmer Rouge Tribunal, the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia for four years. Uh, prior to that, I defended Charles Taylor before the Special Court for Sierra Leone and another individual called Ivan Chermak before the Yugoslav Tribunal. Then I spent, prior to that, a period of about 10 years um, prosecuting at the Yugoslav Tribunal and the International Criminal Court. Uh, the main cases that I was um, at the ICTY, um, a junior later leading counsel uh, on Srebrenica, which we, we'll, we'll talk about this morning. Uh, later at the ICTY, I was lead counsel in cases uh, emerging from Kosovo. Then I worked at the ICC uh, on Uganda and Darfur. So I've had quite a wide experience. Um, what I would say from the outset, I, in talking about genocide and the ICTY, I, I thought about how I would address this. Um, my, my feeling is, and, I, and I'll say this immediately, I wasn't going to say this, but I, but I thought about it and I will, is I think the term genocide, at least the legal definition, uh, it, it, it's an overused term. Um, I, I think it's a legal characterization of events that is often misplaced. I think people, individuals, label certain events a, a, as genocide when often they're not. They're often very, very serious crimes, don't get me wrong. They, they are often crimes against humanity, extermination, uh, mass killing. But, uh, but I think this term of, of genocide in the strict legal sense uh, it, it, it is overused. And I actually, my own personal view, which I will be interested to discuss with you in the question time that we have available, I actually do not think that what happened in Srebrenica was genocide. I worked on that case. I certainly argued that it was genocide. Um, I think clearly very, very serious crimes were committed in Srebrenica, certainly including extermination and murder as a crime against humanity. But I do have my doubts um, about the arguments that we use to justify what happened to the Srebrenica as genocide. And certainly I think in the rest of Bosnia, again, agreed terrible crimes were committed. Um, crimes against humanity and war crimes mass killings of the civilian population. But I'm not sure, again, and I know people argue it's genocide, the courts didn't find generally that the killings that took place and, and other crimes in Bosnia were genocide. Um, but, but I think my position is quite conservative about genocide because I think oftentimes when, when crimes are labeled as genocide, it tends to um, sort of underrate uh, crimes against humanity and war crimes, which are also very serious crimes. I think the same about um, crimes in Darfur, so Sudan. Um, I, I certainly think in Cambodia, uh, there was a genocide. Um, I, I argued that in front of the court, so I'm not sort of against genocide, um, but I think the facts have to be pretty specific. Can we have the first slide, please? So, sorry, yeah. So just to remind you, and I know you've been looking at this for a few days now, but 
Genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial or religious group as such. So it, it's that part of the crime that I think that the Yugoslav tribunal was very, very difficult to prove. The intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, ethnical, racial or religious group by any of the following acts, you know, principally, we know killing members of the group, but also uh, in Bosnia causing serious bodily or mental harm. Uh, and I think it, it is that mental element that is the hardest part um, with this crime, um, actually demonstrating this intention to destroy in whole or in part a whole race of people and that's why I have been fairly reluctant to label um, crimes as genocide in places like Darfur because I simply don't believe that that's what the government's intention was at the time albeit that very serious crimes were committed crimes against humanity etc so um, can we have the next slide please So in July of 1995, uh, Srebrenica was an enclave and you can see it there if you go to the sort of right hand corner of that map. Um, this, is, this is towards the end of the war, this map. And if you look at Bosnia, so you can see the pink area is the area that was occupied by the Bosnian Serb army. Uh, the yellow area was that occupied by the HVO, the Bosnian Croat forces and the green areas were those that were controlled by the Bosnian army. And you can see that in July of 1995, Srebrenica was an enclave completely surrounded um, by Bosnian Serb armed forces. Um, it, it, it was quite clearly when I started working on this case at the end of 1999, so 21 years ago, now 20, 20 years ago, um, it, it was a modern day siege and conditions within the enclave were described uh, as medieval uh, with very little international aid permitted into the area. So in July of 1995, the Bosnian Serb army launched a final massive assault on the Srebrenica enclave. Um, and while there were some lightly armed members um, of the Bosnian armed forces in the enclave, it fell very quickly uh, indeed. And following the fall of, of the enclave, uh, thousands of Bosnian Muslim males aged between anything between 13 and 65, 70 uh, were detained by Bosnian Serb forces. They were captured, they were transported to remote locations where they were summarily executed. In parallel, to these mass executions, uh, 25,000 Bosnian Muslim women, children and elderly men were deported out of this part of Eastern Bosnia. In the context of the war um, in the former Yugoslavia and in the context of human history, these events were and still are absolutely notorious in their scale and brutality. And the judges in the trial judgment and later on appeal said that in their determination. The exact number of murdered people uh, will never be exactly known. But the Yugoslav tribunal found that nearly 8,000 men and boys perished in what was legally characterized as genocide. What I saw, I, I must say, without any kind of exaggeration to you, and I've seen quite a lot of this in, in my career, was that the killing was on such a scale that you, you just simply cannot describe it uh, with standard legal vocabulary because at the time for all of us, it was completely beyond the realms of, of normal experience in terms of domestic criminal law for all of us who had policed or prosecuted in domestic systems. The investigations uh, by the Yugoslav tribunal into Srebrenica uh, were very wide ranging. Um, 
they were groundbreaking actually in many respects. The dead had been buried in a series of mass graves in and around Srebrenica. Those mass graves were subsequently robbed uh, in order to conceal the scale of events by removing the bodies to more remote grave sites um, in and around eastern Bosnia. The perpetrators hoping that they could conceal what they had done from the eyes of the world. Could I have the next slide please? So satellite and aerial imagery provided to the tribunal by a helpful UN member state led us to these mass grave sites. And this aerial imagery you can see before you showed the earthworks in various locations. And indeed, when members of staff at the ICTY, our investigative staff, started digging, um, we literally found thousands of human remains. Um, I ended up actually as a very junior lawyer um, incredibly that I was given this level of responsibility because I didn't have a lot of experience in it. I led a great deal of the forensic evidence at the trial. Um, we had six pathologists working around the clock. I remember uh, le leading evidence in this case, in the Kerstich trial, the first trial around Srebrenica of nearly a thousand autopsies. Um, so going through rapidly with the forensic pathologists trying to recreate for the court how these people had been in life. I mean, that was important for me because there were so many dead. Um, in the end, you could just end up with numbers and you needed to bring these people to life and to say what kind of people they had been in life, that they had lived lives. And just because they were victims of this mass killing, um, they, they needed to be a character before the court, who they were, who they loved, uh, what they did, uh, what they hoped for. All of these things uh, were incredibly important. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So the bodies that we recovered, um, this is one very famous photograph, often had their hands tied behind their backs. Individuals were blindfolded. Gunshot entry wounds often were to the back of the head. So this is a body where you can't see the hands particularly well, but you know they, the hands are tied behind the back. The, the, the individual has a covering over his eyes um, so that he can't see. So what is the legal purpose of that? To demonstrate that this individual had been summarily executed. He had been shot with two rounds uh, to the back of the head. There were two entry wounds in the back of his head. This was important because one of the defense arguments is that these individuals were all victims of conflict, that they had been killed in combat. Of course, the argument that we used at the time, who goes into combat with their hands tied behind their backs and, and wearing a blindfold? No, nobody does that. Can we have the next slide, please? So the next slide, um, here you can see this is an individual with, with his hands uh, tied together. Um, and we were able to actually identify the material that was used to tie people's hands together and link it um, between all of the grave sites. So individuals with serious pre-existing injuries had been murdered. One body of a young man still fully clothed had a love letter from his wife given to him by her as he fled Srebrenica. Um, these are the things that come back to one's mind when I'm you know, writing notes for a talk like this. The scale and nature of, of this murder operation with the staggering number of killings, the systematic and organized manner in which it was carried out, the targeting and relentless pursuit of the victims, and, and it was relentless, let's face it, and the plain intention, apparent from the evidence, to eliminate every Bosnian male who was captured or surrendered at Srebrenica proved beyond reasonable doubt that this was genocide. And these are the words of the court. They're not my words. I've already expressed to you my doubts about whether or not Srebrenica really was genocide. I'm not in any way diminishing the scale of events. They truly were absolutely terrible, um, but I'm not convinced that they were genocide, even though the court uh, found otherwise. 
Um, so it was not an easy trial, um, as you can imagine. Um, I think in an evidential sense, so what the prosecution could prove, it was, um, absolutely over, it was an absolutely overwhelming case, but it was very hard to hear. Um, evidence from a handful of survivors or the relatives of the dead was emotionally charged and extremely distressing. Um, so Jeffrey Nice has just intervened and asked me what kind of additional evidence might have satisfied you about the mental state required for genocide. I think to, to sort of identify specifically for you why I have a problem um, with genocide in Srebrenica is this. Um, the court in the end, you, you will know that you, you, have, you have to have the intention to destroy in whole or in part. So in whole or in part. And I think in, in Srebrenica, the court essentially found, well, I don't think I know because that's what the judgment says, that the, the murder, the, the extermination of these 8,000 men and boys was a part of a part. It, it, it wasn't the whole of the Bosnian Muslim population of Bosnia-Herzegovina, we all accept that. It was certainly a part, but it, it was actually a part of a part. So it was the male population of Srebrenica. And I just don't think that it was a significant enough group of people um, for it to be classified as genocide. I don't in any way diminish the scale of what happened, um, but, I, but I just think there was a certain sense at the time that this needed to be classified as genocide because it was such a terrible crime. What, what had happened was appalling. Um, but I think there was a rush to make it genocide. I'm not sure um, that this specific intent was proven in the case. I'm not sure that we really could prove um, that there was an intention to destroy in part the entire Bosnian Muslim population of Bosnia-Herzegovina. It was clearly extermination. It was clearly a crime against humanity. But, uh, but I simply don't believe that the numbers involved in what happened at Srebrenica, the, these, the, the facts that feed into the mental intent was sufficient to demonstrate that this was an intention to destroy a part of the entire Bosnian Muslim population of Bosnia-Herzegovina, as serious as the crime was. Um, now I'm being asked what should have been the scale number in order, as a, I think that's a very good question and it's a very difficult one to answer. Um, remember, I think one of the problems with this case was it was only the men um, who, who had been murdered. And of course, that, that had a highly destructive effect on the community in Srebrenica because it was um, a patriarchal society where men essentially uh, worked um, to support their families. The women uh, essentially raised the children. So w without men, and, and, that, and that of course is a factor which I think probably, excuse me, supports the, 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 the rape, the, um, the, the, the genocide conviction in the sense that uh, it, it, it effectively destroyed the community. I mean, that was one of the um, arguments that we used and, and the court used in finding genocide because the men were so important to this society. By murdering all of them, you effectively uh, irreparably damaged society. And that is true. I mean, that is, I went back to Srebrenica and I can certainly testify to that myself that society was ruined. Um, anyway, somebody's asked me, um, women were systematically raped, right? I, I'm not sure about that, actually. Um, I, I don't think that, um, I think there were a number of rapes, but I don't think, it may well have happened, um, if you're saying that, Indira. I, I don't recall 
seeing a huge amount of evidence. I think quite possibly these things did happen um, and they weren't reported on very well 20 years ago. They'd probably be reported on better now. Um, anyway, let me, there's another question we'll come back to and we can certainly talk about this discussion um, about genocide, um, but let me uh, carry on. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So that actually just demonstrates that's a secondary grave site and you can see the commingling of the bodies. So essentially bodies were removed from a primary grave site to this grave site and, and here the bodies are all mixed up. So there you can see, you know, pieces of bodies. Um, I'm not just sort of showing that for the gore. I mean, it demonstrates clearly that this was a secondary grave site mm -hmm. because the bodies were all broken up when they were dumped um, in, in this more remote secondary grave site where they hoped to hide uh, what they'd done. Um, so can we have the next slide, please? This is interesting and it kind of argues against um, what I said about genocide. This is a lady called Mrs. Masada Malagic, who I think drove home for all of us the scale of the catastrophe in her account of what happened. She uh, was living with her family in the Srebrenica enclave in July of 1995. She was six months pregnant when the enclave fell to the Bosnian Serbs. She was expelled with her 11 year old son, but every other male member of her family was captured and murdered. And she explained it thus to the court. And I've never forgotten this. I actually have this on a piece of card in my wallet because it was such a compelling piece of evidence that you, you just never can forget it. She said this, she said her father-in-law, Omar Malagic, born in 1926, his three sons, Salka Malagic, born in 1948, who was Mrs. Malagic's husband, Osman Malagic, born in 1953, and Jaffa Malagic, born in 1957, his three grandsons, Elvir Magalic, born in 1973, and Admir Malagic, born in 1978, who were Mrs. Masada Malagic's own sons, and Sama Malagic, born in 1975, who was her nephew. So three generations of one family exterminated, liquidated within the space of a few days. Next slide, please. So another witness who was barely 17 years of age at the time of these events, um, an individual known as Witness So, he survived the massacre of over 1,500 men and boys at a place called Petkov Sidan. Um, now, this young man recounted how he was captured, and that's a photograph of Petkot Sidam in about the year 2000, so 20 years ago. Uh, he was captured outside Srebrenica on the afternoon of the 14th of July and was taken with a group of other prisoners to an empty school in northeastern Bosnia. When darkness fell, witness O heard from heard men from other classrooms within this school being called out in small groups. When these men got down in front of the school, he heard bursts of gunfire. This went on until about midnight. Then soldiers came to the classrooms in which the boy was held prisoner and ordered the prisoners out two by two. He was stripped to the waist, his hands were tied behind his back and he was placed on a covered lorry with other prisoners. They were then driven off into the countryside to the execution site where when he arrived, he saw rows and rows of the dead. He was dragged from the lorry with other men and forced to form a row. The shooting started from behind them. And I recall him saying to the judges that he thought he would die very quickly and not suffer. And he said, I just thought that my mother would never know where I ended up. Miraculously, the boy, although injured, survived and crawled across these many hundreds of bodies. And you can imagine that area that you can see in front of you there, that flat area, that was literally covered with human corpses. At the end of his evidence in court in, in the year 2000, he was asked by the presiding judge if he had anything to add. And he said this, he said, from all whatever I've said and what I saw, I could come to the conclusion that this was extremely well organized. It was systematic killing and that the organizers of that do not deserve to be at liberty. And if I had the right and the courage in the name of all of those innocents and all of those victims, I would forgive. 
I would forgive. I mean, that was an extraordinary thing to hear that he was actually expressing forgiveness of the actual perpetrators of the executions because they were misled. That's all. Um, there was, I recall, um, it was 20 years ago now, about this time, 20 years ago, when he gave evidence, and there was literally a stunned silence in the courtroom. It was a remarkable and very moving moment of the trial. Anyway, can we have the last slide, and then I think I will be quiet and take questions. So this is General Radoslav Kerstic. He was the accused in this case. He was convicted of genocide for Srebrenica. He was the corps commander, so he was the military commander in and around Srebrenica at this time. And of course, there were a number of other Bosnian Serb army officers and civilian officials, including the former president of the Bosnian Serb Republic, Mr. Karadic, and the commander of the Bosnian Serb army, Ratko Mladic, who were also convicted um, of crimes in Srebrenica. So that is really all I wanted to say. Um, I think I've spoken for just over 20 minutes, and I'm certainly happy to take questions. I'm sure there will, people, there will be people that will disagree with me about what I've said about Srebrenica. I have never diminished the seriousness, and I, and I hope you have heard that in what I've said about what happened in Srebrenica. I just think um, that this crime of genocide is overdone. Um, it's, it's, it's used too much. It's used as a legal label too much. There are other crimes against humanity which are incredibly serious um, and which I think reflect the nature of the crimes that, that happened in some of these places. Um, anyway, I'll close there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, we are now uh, 10 minutes to 12. And what I suggest, because Andrew is not going to be with us, uh, for the rest of the week or once across, maybe he will join on and off, but it will be, it is a too great of an opportunity to have this extremely important views that were represented by two prosecutors uh, that in the indictments had to deal with the crime of genocide and there are very interesting overlaps, but also very interesting departures for each other's views. And I think, Andrew, it, it has been extremely helpful that you expressed these sort of views because we certainly do not want to preach uh, one and the same message. Uh, and I think it does open the floor for a very interesting discussion. So I would suggest to use the opportunity to ask same or even similar questions to uh, and Andrew and Jeffrey so that we at least um, wrap up this discussion and that you can make up your own mind what, you, uh, what your arguments and conclusions will be. So the floor is open for the discussion. Uh, Andrew, uh, so I can go and read some of the questions. If you don't mind, I will uh, then uh, go from uh, bottom up. So Sapan, uh, Andrew, you can maybe read this as well and then answer because you will probably remember it better if you read it yourself. You can, you can read it. Uh, yes, um, I can, I can see. Yeah. Out for recording purposes as um, well. I mean, so, the Rome Statute doesn't state that in whole or in part necessarily refers to a proportion of the country as a whole. It appears to remain silent. Would you say the genocide can only be limited to country-wide events? Doesn't the bias towards uh, larger, more populous states? I mean, I think the answer, that's from Adam Smith. Um, and I think the answer to that question is probably yes, actually. Um, it, it doesn't, it doesn't talk about proportions, what the part is. Um, but, I, but I do think it needs to be a significant part. And I think my issue with Srebrenica, and, and again, I don't in any way want to be seen as diminishing what happened in Srebrenica. These were absolutely terrible events. Um, but I, but I do think that the fact that it was limited 
purely to the male population is an argument that tends to suggest it wasn't genocide. Um, I think the fact that the the death of all the male populate or, or a significant proportion of the male population led to the um, destruction of the community. I think that is in favour of saying it, it was genocide. Um, but I but I am of the view when I when it, for example just to compare because the best way to speak about these things is to give a comparison. If I look at what I dealt with in Cambodia. Um, where the Vietnamese uh, population was completely exterminated. There wasn't anybody left at the end of the Khmer Rouge period within the country who was of Vietnamese origin. So there was a Vietnamese minority living within Cambodia. Everybody was either dead, had been killed or had fled. There I could see that as being genocide because there wasn't you know, there were a few members of the population, I think it was a population of about three or 400,000 people, and there were one or two people left. And for me, that was very compelling um, to say that that was genocide. Whereas we know in Bosnia, yes, 8,000 men were killed in Srebrenica, but this was not really a significant part, you know, and, and I, mean, I don't want to underestimate it. It wasn't a highly significant part of the population. Yes, it was a large part of the population, um, but it wasn't a, a very significant part of the population. Um, so I am of the view, I'm still skeptical. I, I argued these positions when I was in the case, um, but I'm still skeptical about whether it is genocide. Um, actually, RF Abraham sent a piece around which disagrees with my position. Absolutely fine. I mean, I'm happy to be disagreed with, that's what this is all about today. Um, okay. Uh, I wonder if Arif could just, yeah, in a couple of sentences as he's with us, um, I I explain, and I mean <coughs> Arif, just a couple of sentences because time is short, what your thesis is that the, uh, those who come to read your piece would, would be looking for. So I, I can appreciate that, um, obviously Andrew is not diminishing crime and I'm, I'm not going to suggest in any way that he is and he takes a view that is held by practitioners and judges and others. Uh, my own view is that the starting point is that for genocide you do not need any killings whatsoever. There are five prohibited acts under the convention that Andrew has set out. So you can in theory have individuals being subjected to serious bodily or mental harm without any killings yet the perpetrators may well indeed have an intent to destroy. And for whatever reason, they may not achieve physical or biological destruction. So that is the starting point. Second, when we talk about um, the destruction of a protected group in part, Andrew's right that it has to be a substantial part, a substantial and or significant part. Now, there is jurisprudence about what that means, and that was substantially developed by the tribunal in, in Kerstich. Now, the, the issue which is really trans, uh, the issue here which is really obvious is there would be a significant lacuna in the law if you are going to say that um, you can only uh, you can only get you can only meet the test if you if you target the entirety of a population in a particular country. And in fact, even at even when we consider um, the question of the elimination of the Jews during the Holocaust, everybody has accepted and recognized that what we were talking about were the European Jewry. You could not actually have possibly talked about the destruction of all Jews everywhere because the perpetrators would not have had that extent of control. So the decision in Srebrenica moved away from the, the argument that the numbers are determin determinative whether the numbers are absolute or relative, and what the chamber had said, and I believe probably rightly said, although that raises a number of questions which I'll, I'll discuss tomorrow, is that when we move beyond the numbers, we ought to look at the significance of Srebrenica in other ways. Why was it substantial? It was substantial because it was a UN safe area. It was substantial because it had strategic influence. It was substantial because it was contig contiguous 
on the border with uh, Serbia at the time. It was substantial because the physical perpetrators and the, the army actually didn't have control of the entirety of Bosnia at that time, but they did have control over Srebrenica and the surrounding areas. And it had significance in terms of religious and symbolic influence to the community that was subject to being targeted, which were the Bosnian Muslims. And then finally, the idea that the men were targeted may indeed have, have, have demonstrated an intent to actually destroy the group by preventing um, possible uh, the future continuity of the group. Because of course, if you destroy all the men, how are you going to have kids? How are you going to have children? And, and that was something that the, the tribunal had considered. Uh, I accept to some extent Andrew's um, position that there are always going to be difficulties because um, you will not have a smoking gun where a perpetrator says, I'm going to kill all these people because I want to destroy the group. But you will have circumstantial evidence and you have to infer intent. And that is what the judges did. They were trying to infer the intent in the absence of not having a smoking gun, so to speak. Thank you, Arif. Uh, uh, Andrew? I mean, again, I, these things, I'm not, um, I'm not uh, Solomon. I, I don't have all the answers. I, I suppose I, I feel that the definition of genocide has been sort of stretched. Um, and, I, and I worry that uh, we, we use it too easily to characterize events. I mean, everything that's just been said, I can't disagree with. Um, but I do feel that at the time um, in Kerstich that we stretched it, you know, the court stretched the legal definition of genocide. But factually, any, everything that's been said, I don't disagree. And indeed, I said it myself, that um, the, the, the targeting of the men was to, in a sense, destroy the community. And that's what the judges found. But I suppose it's just the, from the corner of the room that you look at things. And, you know, when I went on to Cambodia in particular, and I saw events there, I think that reinforced my skepticism um, about the characterization of Srebrenica as genocide because of what happened there. Anybody else? Um, let's see. Sapan, if the uh, judge states officials by the same and there are standards as individuals in domestic courts, don't we risk always falling short of proving systemic intentionality? They will usually have the capacity to destroy evidence proving their intention. Might it be more effective to judge them, to judge them by a model of corporate agencies applied in fraud? trials so uh, this is more of a question related to law reform as opposed to something that might exist now but um the, the reason i'm i'm perhaps this is not fair but i'm i'm thinking of applying concepts of labor law to criminal law when i ask this question about inequality of bargaining power so we recognize that um parties to a dispute might, might have inequality of arms. Perhaps we should apply a similar concept to criminal law where we recognize that state officials have the machinery of the state at their hands and so they have the capacity to systematically destroy information that might possibly incriminate them. And I think that with the reason we have stuck to this very rigid definition of genocide potentially is because the Nazi war machine was so, was so transparent and nakedly efficient in in, in, uh, in um, uh, recording its destruction of the Jewish population of Europe. And um, given that they were so unashamed about that and set a normative precedent against genocide, it's highly likely therefore that future regimes that might want to pursue similar policies would just want to eliminate the evidence proving that they were responsible for such things. So a great example from a contemporary situation might be the civil war in Syria where it is only because um, of that gentleman who named himself Caesar and the fact that he took photographs of the, the elimination of life inside these uh, torture prisons and military hospitals inside Syria, that we even know at all about um, uh, 
the, the, the mass you know uh, executions and and, and, other, and other related crimes so what i'm trying to say is is that when we're prosecuting um individuals and, and states officials for crimes against humanity should we take into account the their capacity to destroy evidence i'm not sure how we would potentially do that but at least be mindful of it and then and, and i suggested Sapan, the the fraud call Sapan, can you uh, repeat the last sentence because at least for me the sentence was broken and i think it's important what you have to say can you oh. repeat the sentence Sorry, can, can you hear me now? Better. Okay, well, what I was saying is that in the UK, at least at the moment, there's a discussion amongst um, proponents of corporate criminal law reform to say that um, when we're, the, one of the reasons that uh, fraud trials are collapsing quite frequently is because of the inability to prove that there was a directing mind and will behind the commission of the fraud. And so one possibility that has been suggested is to diminish that, that mens rea standard and also to hold people accountable for failing to prevent economic crimes. And I think that has actually been brought forth into statute now. So I'm just trying to put all these different ideas together of, of some ideas from labor laws, some ideas from corporate fraud law and saying, do we not have a very antiquated view of what intentionality looks like and a state's and, and how we approach prosecution of states in that respect? Well, I would have thought it would be extreme, extreme, I'll ask Andrew to finish. I would have thought it would be an extremely risky step where you've got the most, what people choose to regard as the, the gravest crime, reflecting of the very worst things that humans can do to humans. That is actually how genocide is conceived in a, in, in a general way, I think it'd be a very risky step to reduce the requirements for proper proof of mental state. But Andrew? I No, I'm just not agreeing with you with the sake that I agree with you. Um, I think the crime is so serious uh, that it has to have this form, this very narrow form of specific intent. Um, and, you know, let's recall the, the author of it, you know, was a Polish Jew himself. Um, but he, I think, realized at the time, and certainly when he lobbied the United Nations to, um, to, to, to enact the, the Genocide Convention, genocide must have this very high level of mental intent, because I think otherwise it, it diminishes the seriousness of the crime. And, and that, is a, that is something I feel very strongly about. I mean, I've made my position clear on mm -hmm. that. I completely accept what the court found in Srebrenica. I was a prosecutor on the case, but deep down, I feel that genocide must be used to address the most serious uh, international crimes committed by human beings, and it needs to have this very high level. Um, of Andrew, 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 with respect, I think you misconstrued my question. Okay. I, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we diminish the mens rea standard. I'm simply saying that when we approach the commission of crimes by states and state officials, perhaps we should be more mindful of the ways in which they might incriminate, uh, they might destroy evidence that would otherwise incriminate them. Um, so that's not to say that we should say that we're not looking for intent, but that we need to have a much, perhaps potentially have a more expansive view of how we construe intent. That's all I'm trying to say. In yeah. terms of the evidence that you would, adduce to prove the intent is that what you're saying exactly exactly and what kinds of evidence do you think could be adduced that perhaps hasn't been adduced in the past to prove these kinds of crimes i mean i'm interested well, in that because i agree with you it's the hardest part of this crime to prove well i mean now i have to admit my own ignorance because i'm not sure okay. but but Looking to the Syria example, from which I, I do have some familiarity, uh, if, if, for example, you, you, you could find evidence that a state had, um, uh, uh, you know, for example, it was found that in Syria, one of the reasons why um, 
the, 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 the personal details of detainees in these prisons were not recorded was specifically to prevent a future successful prosecution that that was found out was and it was because of that that this this uh, inside regime official Caesar went went around photographing yeah. everything so that's an example of that challenges the act omission distinction right where we can say that this was a purposeful omission which might which which might have resulted in us developing or finding the evidence that we could otherwise use to prosecute but if you were to go on a very strict um approach to the crime of genocide we, we which is which is where we would only look for actions rather than omissions then we wouldn't be able to find the evidence for it yeah i mean it's interesting actually because in srebrenica i you know again and this this is a piece of evidence that goes against my position um but during the trial, uh, witnesses often turned up with bits of evidence that had not been available to us at the beginning of the trial. So people would turn up with photographs. And I remember um, one Dutch soldier turning up with a sort of scrapbook full of photos. And one of the photos was of a big pile of um, what looked like small plastic cards. And it was a bonfire, so it was a big fire. That somebody had set and I looked at this photograph and I thought well that's very strange and he took that literally the I think it was within two days of the enclave falling and I had the photograph um, examined by, by a specialist and it was actually um, a pile of identity cards of all of the people who'd been captured and so what they were doing was basically destroying any evidence um, that these people had lived. So it was right. to do exactly what you just said was done in Syria, to destroy any evidence that these people had ever lived at all. Um, you know, powerful piece of evidence. And then subsequently we got um, a Bosnian Serb who was cooperating with us to acknowledge that, that that's what was done. They collected all forms of identity from people, passports, identity cards, and just destroyed them because they didn't want these records to exist that these people had ever been in custody. So, no, abs absolutely, I, I accept what you're saying. There's one thing I'd like to add, and it's a bit technical, of a, I hope not really technical. Uh, Sapan, there's a difference between um, relying on evidence that isn't available to prove something positive, and that is the equivalent to raising a presumption against someone, and, and that's something we, in the common law, I'm not saying the common law is necessarily right on this, but that's something in the common law you never do. If you can, and, and I think correctly, if you're going to say you're going to prove something against something, you don't do it by what's missing or by what somebody doesn't say. However, if you have independent proof, uh, and if it's, or if it is an absolutely irresistible inference that you can draw, that the destruction of something or the non-production of something uh, was with a unique and single purpose, then you can allow it to be evidence. But I think it's a slippery slope uh, of a dangerous kind to say that something that is missing allows you to infer um, uh, something about somebody's state of mind. Uh, yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for raising the point about the irresistible inference. I wasn't aware of that uh, previously. So um, if, that, if that's, if that's a, a method of reasoning that already exists in these procedures, then perhaps my question was for purpose. But I think I was getting to a more general point about um, why it might not always be wise to apply domestic criminal law um, methods to the international context because of the wider systematic, systemic inequalities. But Thank we've you. now exhausted the question. I'm very grateful for everyone's answer. No, no, thank you, Sap, and this, the, we, we are going to have discussion until 2045, because then, Drew, if you agree, I think it's too important to break it now. And just about the missing documents, uh, um, you know, do not forget that in international criminal procedures and trials, what happens is that we investigate as uh, long as the trial goes on and beyond for the purposes of appeals. So uh, when I was on the investigative part of, uh, of this, so when you would ever have a gap, 
such a clear gap that something is missing. You go and invest, investigate, it's such an important indicator where you should investigate. So for example, we got Mladic's diaries at certain point handed over by Serbian state. I got the Mladic diaries in my hand. And the first thing I do, I go straight to 11 July. And he was talking about some uh, philandering of his officers in uh, April 92. And then I come to 11 July and it was like he's making uh, some sort of uh, uh, general observations of the, of, of the situation. So you see that the diary is not genuine and the right thing to look into this. So you go and reinvestigate. So do not forget the power of investigations and the leads gap in a, in a chronology or uh, thoroughness uh, uh, gives you for investigative purposes. Thank you. And the next one, just see. The next one is Holly's uh, question. Do you consider there to be any major failings of the prosecution or anything you wished had been handled or argued differently in retrospect? In, in Srebrenica? Krstic case, obviously. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think the biggest mistake that we made in that case, actually, I mean, to sorry, to start from the beginning, I think it was a very uh, well investigated case. I mean, I think it was probably uh, the best case I ever worked on in terms of the evidence. Um, I think the major mistake that we made in that case concerned um, a, uh, an, an, an intercepted communication in which Kerstich was recorded. As, so the, the Bosnian army had been recording um, communications between senior Bosnian Serb military officers. Um, so they, they were listening. The Bosnian army was essentially listening in to the communications uh, between Bosnian Serb officers. Um, and they picked up one communication involving Kerstic in which he effectively used this phrase, um, kill them, kill them all. Uh, and it was supposed to be in reference to uh, Bosnian prisoners. The, d the date of it uh, was not very clear, actually. And I think, as my memory serves me, it was said quite some time um, after the events at Srebrenica. So it was, it was later. It was about, I think, July the 15th. Um, and it and involved sort of stragglers that they were picking up. Anyway, it was decided... Um, by counsel on the case um, that that would not be disclosed to the defence when actually it, it, it absolutely should have been disclosed because obviously there is an obligation, a fundamental obligation, the prosecution has got to disclose its case to the defence but the decision was made, we won't disclose it, we hope that um, Kersic gives evidence and we'll spring this on him. It was sprung on him. Um, he said, I re recall his exact words, this is a montage, it's a, it's a fabrication, I never said this. I mean, I think it probably was Kerstich who said it. But we were made to look absolutely appalling in front of the judges, in particular the, um, the American judge, uh, the late Judge Patricia Wald, who died actually in January of last year, who was a very fine judge. Um, on the, she was on the... Um, the, D the DC circuit, so the, the, the sort of the, the federal circuit immediately below the Supreme Court, very, very able woman. And she was stunned that we hadn't actually disclosed that piece of evidence. And I think that did us a lot of damage um, in, in terms of our credibility before the court. It was done because colleagues thought on the case that, you know, it was good to surprise this individual with this piece of evidence. Um, I didn't think it was a good idea at all. If you, if you go into Archbold on criminal pleading, the, you know, the English and Welsh Bible on criminal law, it's absolutely clear that you can't do this. You know, you must disclose these elements to the defence so that people can prepare what they're going to say. Um, and I think the surprise on Kerstich actually did us no favours at all. It didn't achieve anything. And I think it made us look slightly dishonest, unfortunately. Um, I think that's in my view of that, my recollection of the case, that's the biggest mistake that we made. 
Thank you. Nana, Nana, before we uh, go back, can I just backtrack one point? There's a, there's a difference between something that isn't produced and drawing an inference about that and there's something which somebody doesn't say when they should or doesn't do when they should from which you may draw an inference. So that after Srebrenica, there were meetings stenographically recorded and indeed tape recorded, although we were never given the tapes, big meetings of Milosevic and others at which uh, Ml Mladic uh, uh, was in attendance. When he arrived, everyone was sworn to secrecy, but in the course of the meeting, no one said anything about what was already internationally known about the wrongdoings at Srebrenica, and he wasn't challenged. So that's an example of where, as against the participants at the meeting and Milosevic, you could draw an inference from his not saying something, from the negative, i.e. he should have said something if he was concerned about the wickedness that had happened. Could you infer from the fact that he was silent that he approved of it or indeed was a party to it? A tiny piece of positive evidence, but it's a, an example of how negative can prove positive. Nena? Um, Carol Green Hodge, I'm surprised you didn't link the Srebrenica genocide to events in 1992. UN Commission, my experts, concluded a case <laughs> to answer for genocide in Priedor in 92. Srebrenica was not an isolated occurrence. Andrew? Well, I mean, again, you know, we can have different views about what is and what isn't genocide. Um, I know. I mean, as, as we all know, the courts in the end found that Srebrenica was the only genocide in Bosnia. They simply didn't find genocidal intent at a level elsewhere in Bosnia. Again, and I know I keep saying this, it doesn't diminish the seriousness of the crimes that took place in places like Priador. I mean, you know, mass killing of civilians, uh, destruction <laughs> of civilian property, um, expulsion of the civilian population, all of these things happened, um, but nobody, you know, the courts did not find it to, to be genocide. And I know, you know, to this day, I get emails from people talking about the genocide in, in Bosnia. The courts didn't find that, um, except in Srebrenica. Um, I don't really know what else I can say. On well, that. I know that Nana and I would say something, and okay, that is cool. that, and that is that there, there is a contrary yeah. uh, and strongly held view that genocide simply cannot happen on a couple of days in July. It is always yeah. a process. It is always yeah. a process, and that we would have argued, and indeed would argue, if we were ever, ever able to get the Bosnians' case back before the International Court of Justice, that their limited time finding was completely erroneous, unfair to the uh, victims and so on and so forth. That doesn't enlarge or change the difference between uh, us and your personal view, Andrew, in, in respect of, of a part of a community. Uh, we just take a different view about yeah. how, uh, how long it might have lasted. I think Carol would like to, to intervene or say something. Carol, can you turn on your mic? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, Carol, we can. Okay. Welcome. Yes, so the, um, I just wonder what Andrew thinks of this. The Karadzic uh, appeals um, case, there was one uh, dissenting judge. Who was judge, that? Who was that, Carol? Uh, judge de Prado Solesa, okay. a senior okay. Spanish judge. Yeah. Okay, if I can just quote to you what he says, and this is on genocide in the municipalities. Um, he says, the concept of the crime of genocide makes sense when understood as extreme criminal acts of discrimination against human groups, which can go as far as their physical destruction, but also includes all acts tending to this finality. And in this context, he, con he contended that thousands of Bosnian Muslims and Bosnian Croats, whom the trial chamber categorized as merely displaced, were in fact subjected to conditions of life aimed at their physical destruction. I think the the events of 1992 are so important because if you look at the UN Commission of Experts report, they detailed the case of genocide in Priodor, and this was at the time. They, ever, the events were fresh then, which they weren't, say, in the late 90s. Yeah. And they saw hey, it in Priodor. Yeah. In Priodor. 
there were attempts to destroy all the leaders, whether it was political, legal, clerical, yep. um, business people. This, to me, this, this is an attempt to destroy a group. So, so it, it is extremely helpful uh, quote, Carol. Uh, and another connection with this, and mind you, my lecture is called Misjudging uh, History and uh, Genocide uh, Judgments and the BH, where I'm going to deal into very detailed research to show you charts as well, how it looks like. So I will keep my lecture for tomorrow morning because I think it is quite enough what we are dealing with now. But Andrew, would you allow the following, that your case was the first genocide case at the tribunal and it dealt with a um, uh, officer of Republika Srpska army so that you did not actually have this a larger political context which would explain intent if we would connect every and each crime and individual to the Serbian structures because as we know General Krstic as well was actually the officer of uh, Army of Yugoslavia with headquarters in Belgrade but in your cases you did not deal with that at all as part of intent of political elites who brought about this uh, genocide. In other words, would it make difference if your first case would be a case of politician on a higher level? Would you allow that that would possibly bring you to different type of evidence when intent is concerned and that we who prosecuted politicians had actually a very different approach to almost the same evidence, but we looked for different own words than you could find in prosecuting general. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd accept that. I would accept the fact that when you're prosecuting senior political figures, um, that the outcome could be different. I mean, it is interesting because I now, you said this, I recall very clearly, you remember the Bosnian Serb assembly in 1992, you know, where they recorded what they were saying. And Mladic, General Rakel Mladic actually gets up on his feet at that meeting when they're talking about moving uh, or removing the non-Serbian population from Bosnia. And Mladic actually gets up and says, gentlemen, you do realize that this would be genocide. He characterizes it, he states that publicly in 1992. So if you're asking me about is, is the mens rea for a lower level but senior military commander like Kerstic narrower than the kind of mens rea that you could prove for a higher figure um, who would know much more deeply than Kerstic would have known about the entire sort of national policy, the, the argument is yes. But then again, it all depends on the evidence, doesn't it? Because again, you could have a senior military figure like Kerstic, who was well aware um, that the intention was to essentially destroy the Muslim population of, of Srebrenica. And I think he probably did, actually. I think Kerstic probably did know that at the time. But I do agree with you, yes, political figures, it, it is, um, there is a wider scope of evidence available to prove this very specific form of intent, yeah. One small correction, Nena. Uh, it wasn't the first genocide case. We don't have time no, to go into its significance. Yelisic, which we may touch, was the first yeah. genocide yeah, case. Yeah, I, I meant first genocide judgment. You had yeah. a case, first genocide case, but without the genocide no, judgment. It's, it's, it's got other relevance, but we don't have time to it. Back to the questions to Andrew. It all goes back to the birth of Christ and the first <laughs> cases. <laughs> Jeffrey ever did it, I said to I am No, sorry. no, no, don't be silly. <laughs> I am silly. Yeah. There is ask, no law against silliness. So ask I'll Andrew some more questions. Silly. Come along now. Ruby Peacock, doesn't killing all of all males also restrict the group's ability to produce future generations, suggesting a motivation to end the group's existence, if not immediately? Yes. I think it's been touched on already anyway, so feel free. Oh, by by uh, Arif. Okay, I thank think, you. I agree. I agree. Yeah. So Indira from New York, very sleepy, is saying, I'm just sorry for you that you needed to deal with these serious crimes as a junior prosecutor. Evidence is an issue. What do you do in the, in the if re-educated? I'm glad you are comparing it with Vietnam, but we all know in that you are comparing 
to understand process and mechanism, how has genocide changed since World War II? Roma were not accounted. Also, as per total, total population, would you use systematically or forceful humiliate the women? I would suggest for anyone here to read Anna Arendt's Achman in Jerusalem. Secondly, H.T. Norris, Islam in the Balkans. It must have been difficult for you. What is your, your question, Indira? Uh, well, I see, see what the question, do you see that the uh, genocide as a, uh, as, as a crime has been developed in any different way than uh, how it was coined as a term in uh, 48? Is there changes in genocidal uh, development? I mean, there has, there has been. I mean, even if, you know, giving the specific example of what we're talking about, where the court found that you can have, when, when the, the genocide, the, the definition of genocidal intent speaks of an intention to destroy in whole or in part. The courts found at the ICTY that you can have a part of a part because obviously the male population of Srebrenica was not strictly speaking a part, you know, it was a part of a part. So there has been um, judicial development and expansion of genocide. Um, I think you'll find if you talk to people, um, what's the um, what's the Canadian uh, scholar who wrote the Bible on genocide? Um, uh, Bill Shabus. Yeah. I mean, I think Shabus tends to agree with me that he thinks it's been expanded too much uh, because, like me, he believes that there are very, very serious crimes, crimes against humanity, that can properly address uh, much of what we're talking about um, and, that, and that genocide should be... Uh, not isolated, but certainly it should be restricted to the the most serious crimes. Uh, Andrew, my very uh, usual uh, reply, even when we yeah. when we have discussion in in court in a classroom, is as follows: If we would not make distinction between crimes against humanity and genocide, then we would have in a courtroom the charges against someone like Nasser Oric, a representative of Bosnian Muslims who was there to defend enclave. And in the process, uh, uh, there was the situations when the Serbs in the neighborhood were killed and General Ratko Mladic. So we would have representatives of a group that was targeted as protected group of genocide and General Mladic actually charged with the same crimes. For me, genocide charges absolutely unnecessary to show the nuances in uh, any type of, of, uh, of crimes during the war. So for me, genocide is absolutely needed, practical and realistic a way to make distinction what was actually intention of the Serbs to conquer the territory, which was almost 100% populated by members of protected group of Bosnian Muslims. And then you look into Nasser Oric and look what could be criminal intent of him. Well, they would say survival because it's the winter. They were locked uh, in, a, in a Srebrenica as a city. There were about five times more, more people, refugees from the surroundings who found refuge in the city of Srebrenica and they were hungry. So what they did, they say, we went out to the Serb farms to steal the food, so forth, et cetera. And in the process, they were killing Serbian farmers. It, it, for me, it is essential, essential to make the difference. And I think this sort of uh, uh, view that you are taking and many of your lawyers who follow Shabbos's view basically are not trying to prove the test of, of, of genocide in a court when we are allowed to do it. You can say it is maybe charged more often that it's needed, but look at the genocide uh, judgments. We hardly have any. You know, we have genocide crimes ongoing if we are to believe people who report it all over the world, but look at the outcome of the court. So in my view, it would be charge and prosecute crime of genocide as much as you can when you have enough prima facie and case to answer evidence, because we absolutely need practical court outcome in order to improve ourselves in presenting finding evidence and to comparing the cases. So yes, I am for absolute distinction. And does Andrew agree with that policy approach? Andrew, no. Mm -hmm. No. 
I asked Andrew if he agreed with that as a policy. I, I, I understand the point that's being made because the point that's being made is that the intention of the Bosniaks within the enclave who were defending themselves in terms of the crimes that they committed was very different to the intention of the Bosnian Serbs who were attacking the enclave. But I don't think um, that the utilization of the crime of genocide to make that distinction is necessary. Because I think if you look at, say, the crimes that Nasser Orich committed in terms of you know, foraging for food, trying to find food and supplies to keep the enclave going, I think these were war crimes. Um, I don't think that any of those crimes that he committed um, were, were crimes against humanity. And indeed, in the end, I think he was acquitted, wasn't he? He was, yeah, he was, he was acquitted. Yeah. He was acquitted. But the things that happened were, were probably at their worst war crimes. So um, unarmed members of the Bosnian Serb forces uh, killed uh, in the process of looking for food and supplies. These were not crimes against humanity. They weren't directed you know, at a civilian population in the way that the Bosnian Serbs directed the attack against Srebrenica. So I agree with the distinction that you make, but I disagree with the necessity to use genocide to make this very stark distinction between what the Bosniaks were doing and what the Bosnian Serbs were doing. I think you can do it, as I've said already, uh, through crimes against humanity. Um, simple as that. Thank you. And Holly, it comes to your question, which we are going to maybe to, to discuss at the end, because it will be nice wrap up to my distinction between uh, these four uh, families of international criminal uh, charges. Um, so where are we now? Uh, Nathan, uh, wouldn't Srebrenica be a genocidal act within the larger genocide being committed throughout the Bosnian war? Ta uh, taking all of the atrocities committed in their totality would mean genocide occurred. If you go from 92 to 95, would yeah. you be then convinced that there was a genocide? Well, I mean, I mean, the courts found the answer to that question is no. They found, they found that Srebrenica was a genocide, but they found that the totality of, of the acts were not a genocide. I mean, we've had this discussion already. I mean, I, I completely acknowledge, and I think as Carol said earlier, I mean, there, there's evidence to point to the fact that there were certainly genocidal acts, um, but I don't think it was enough in terms of the crimes that took place in the municipalities for it to be characterized as genocide. I mean, how, how do you distinguish in law between genocidal act and genocide? Well, I think you can have, um, you can have people, so for example, and I, now I talk about another conflict like in Darfur, um, there, there were people amongst those committing the crimes who did have genocidal intention. So you'd probably be able to find people that did have genocidal intention, but not everybody did have genocidal intention. So there would have been Bosnian Serbs in Priadol, probably, who wanted to completely destroy the population in Priadol. But then there were probably other people that just wanted them to leave. So you can have this sort of mixed intention, and that's been interpreted. I'm not saying whether it's right or it's wrong, that that's not enough, basically, to then go up the chain of command and say, actually, there was genocidal intent. Well, no, there wasn't, because not everybody had the same intention when they committed these crimes. And incidentally, that shows the sort of problem of prosecuting a state. If you conceive of a state of, say, a cabinet of five members sat round a table, and they decide to destroy a particular group of people, three of them want to do it because they have genocidal intent, two of them want to do it because they want them to move out or because they want to avoid them rising up again as soldiers, what have you proved against the state? Very difficult. Uh, thank you. As I reminded you in a half-time judgment in Milosevic case, we did at least uh, convince judges that there is case to answer for Milosevic defense case that there was a genocide in 92 yeah. and 95. So do not forget that because uh, who knows how would genocide history, legal history look like if he uh, achieved the end of that case. So uh, Ruby said not only to destroy evidence, but also to stretch, uh, strategize the extermination in such a way that it is difficult to ev evidence from the outset. Uh, 
e.g. killing only men because it looks more like a traditional act of war than genocide, following on Sutton's comments. Before Andrew answers, can I just add a, a bit of contemporaneous information? Um, those of you interested in what is happening in Northwest China may know that a recent report has come, come out on the basis of uh, expert uh, analysis of evidence about f forced birth control of the Uyghur population. And the report raises without answering as a proposition that this may, have, may reflect the gravest of international crimes and it clearly has genocide in mind. So mm -hmm. that's part of the same issue that Andrew- Exactly, so either you uh, attack productivity of a, a male population, or a repro reproductive function mm -hmm. of male or female. Um, yeah, but this is what you, someone called, I think, Sapan, this long-term and not in, immediate uh, impact of the genocidal policies, which is difficult then to prove. But what do you think about this? What, what Can you will be said? Question? Sorry, I've lost the- I've lost the <laughs> uh, Killing the man because it <laughs> yeah. looks more like a traditional act of war than genocide. Ruby is actually asking, weren't Serb forces not even very uh, sly in doing things that they did because they knew that it, they could get away with the genocide oh, in an easier way if they targeted yeah. only yeah. male population? I think, I, I think that's probably true. I mean, I, I think, yeah. if, look, I think the reason, the reason, the, 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 the strategic reason that they killed those people was because the war was coming to an end and the Bosnian Serbs, I mean, this is just my view, but the, the Bosnian Serbs knew the war was coming to an end. And the biggest problem that they had, the Bosnian Serbs, was manpower. They, they didn't have the manpower to fight this war. And they knew that the Bosniaks did. And every time these areas were, were basically uh, cleared of, of, of Bosnian Muslim population within Eastern Bosnia, the, the, they went to Tuzla, you know, they went to what was called, as you know, the free territories. And these people immediately were put in uniforms and put on the front line and fighting the Serbs. And that's why I think they did it, because they didn't want um, these men to be joining the Bosnian army and on the line fighting them in sort of two or three months later. Now, there were other consequences of what they did, the destruction of the communities uh, in the Bosnian Muslim communities in Srebrenica. But I think that's principally why they did what they did. Um, it was to reduce the military manpower of, of the Bosnian government, um, you know, in a completely illegal way and in a way that targeted civilians um, and executed people who were either prisoners of war or civilians uh, and committing a massive crime. But I think that's what this was about. That's my oh. personal view. Henry V Agincourt defense. Next question, Nena. How long are we going on, by the way, Nena? Uh, well, we, we have about six minutes left, but we have so many questions, and I'm always over ambitious, so I would like to wrap it up with Andrew because, Andrew, it has been extremely valuable. And I must say, you are agreeing much more with us, maybe because of our manpower, <laughs> but you still defend your position. There was a genocide where all your answers are yes, it was a genocide. So I don't want to put he, uh, the words in your mouth, but um, it is extremely, I, I find this fascinating way of discussing. So Tahir is, act, Yasser, uh, Tahir is asking, some people actually call genocide a convention increasingly means meaningless document actually trying to help you out to say if the genocide convention is more flexible in intent maybe it was a genocide so what do you think about uh, qualification of increasingly meaningless document first of all andrew doesn't need helping out his position is very well argued and i'm going to stick up for him having okay. a complete and equal right <laughs> against the majority of whatever you might think you have Go on, Andrew. Okay, Andrew, go. So, uh, is it an increasingly meaningless? I, I, don't, I don't think so, actually, because if I, even though, as I've said to you, I don't think Srebrenica, for me, was clearly genocide. I also don't think Darfur um, was genocide, but I mean, that's another story. But I certainly believe that, say, what happened in Rwanda w was a genocide. There was an intention to destroy, in substantial part, the... the, the a part of the population and that's what they did you know they killed nearly a million people and if i look at Ca cambodia in terms of the um khmer krom 
um, and the Vietnamese, the Khmer Krom minority, the Vietnamese minority, these were groups that were targeted by the government at the time, by the Khmer Rouge, for substantial destruction. And we have the documents to prove that. The, the intention was to destroy these people. And it was there. And, and it happened. And at the end of the Khmer Rouge period, there were very few of these people living um, in Cambodia any longer. They'd all either been murdered or had fled. So, mm -hmm. yeah, go sorry. Ahead. No, no, uh, go ahead. So, I, so all I'm saying is, I think there are instances where the evidence is very clear of, of um, either entire or partial destruction. And there is evidence, not just from the, the, the acts on the ground from what's happened, but also in terms of documents to prove that that's what the, the controlling powers intended to happen. And I don't think Srebrenica was so clear like that. That's all I'd say. Uh, but Andrew, what you are now claiming is almost this uh, uh, p problem that we have from Second World War, that uh, genocide is easier to prove as a crime if protective group did not have organized arms, armed defense. And Bosnian Muslims obviously did have. And uh, so if you, and we think, I, I hope we had moved from that position that you need to have defenseless and not armed group to, sh to, to legitimately uh, use arms to protect their, their people and identity. And I, uh, what, what is your take on this? Are you hey, so arguing that it's easier? To yeah, prove I that? mean, uh, yes. I'm not gonna dispute that it's easier to prove it where people are um, defenseless. Uh, as opposed to where people have some form of defense. But I still don't, um, because again, I, I suppose what we're now doing is we're, we're, we're looking at the origins of this crime within the Holocaust, you know, the completely defenseless Jewish people who were rounded up and taken to camps and exterminated. Um, but I don't, I, I wouldn't actually say to you that that would be, for, for me, in deciding whether or not what happened in Bosnia was genocide, I don't think it would be determinative for me that just because there's an armed force within that ethnic group who are targeted for these terrible crimes, that that means it's not genocide because there are armed people. I think it depends upon all of the facts. And I think that's just one factor um, amongst many that you have to consider in deciding whether or not it, it, it is genocide and i know these these determinations they 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 they, they give rise to to you know people feeling very strongly very strong feelings about this i i mean i do understand that but just all i'm saying is based on my experience of you know other courts other cases i'm still not entirely convinced that srebrenica was a genocide but it was a very serious crime you know, it was a crime against humanity. It was extermination. There's no doubt about that in my mind at all. I'm not an apologist for what happened there. It was one of the worst crimes, you know, of post-war Europe. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind about that at all. But whether it should be characterized as genocide for the reasons I've said, for all of the factors that point to it being genocide, I, I still have concerns and doubts in my mind about it. If you're, going to, if you're going to close it there, are we able to preserve for, to, for tomorrow the, the list of chat questions because some of them oh, need we, to be we need to save the chat. We need to because, save that. Uh, yeah, uh, because we are now closing to quarter to one and it's been ex at least for me very intensive morning. So I think it will be a good time to thank Andrew. Can and I interpose before this. you, can you close it, but can I say how really valuable it is within this community to have someone who happens to express a contrary view on something that's as finely balanced and difficult, because it really shows how people of goodwill and good intention can reach different conclusions on this critically important alleged crime. Nana, please close it. Uh, it, it is the genocide um, debates are ongoing debates in, at all possible uh, levels. And what is important, as you see from this morning, how important it is to have a meaningful uh, debate and dialogue about it without really closing your, yourself in your, in your position. And uh, most important thing is to listen to other people's arguments. 
uh, and not trying to win the uh, the argument as I tried and failed. So don't don't follow me. <laughs> it, it doesn't work always. Uh, so uh, Andrew, thank you so much. By all means, try to join us anytime, especially tomorrow, but also when uh, Mr. Granich comes to talk yes. because you worked on related cases as well. Yeah. When creation crimes and war in a uh, uh, role in 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 um, and Bosnia and Croatia is concerned. And for tomorrow, we will, uh, I will, we will send you uh, codes for The Snow, the film that deals with a, a Bosnian community full of women with only two men, a Hoja who is very old one and a boy. So they represent in the film uh, what is left of this fractured uh, community and all other people are women in the village. And the film will give you a good sense of what are we talking on the ground, what really happens after these sort of atrocities and what these communities want, uh, what sort of information or closures they want to, in order to move on. And then I will start at 10 o'clock with my misjudging, misjudging history. Uh, and I'm using judgments on genocide of uh, ICTY tribunal to show it. It is now peer reviewed article about to be published at um, European Journal of Rule of Law, something like that. So it is pre uh, previewing for all of us. So I'm not going to send you the whole article because I'm quite sure I will have to cut some pages because of the length. So we are going to do it tomorrow. And then after me, very, uh, appropriately Arif is go will try to give you an umbrella of where are we stand now as a global society when it comes to development of um, uh, genocide um, jurisprudence and academic uh, review and debate so it will be a week of five days where we did uh, try to dedicate fully to uh, Srebrenica genocide as part of or, or the, the core of the title of our course this year because we wanted to commemorate and remember uh, Srebrenica 25 years after it's now quarter of a century that we still try to keep it remembered. So thank you so much. We are going to uh, save all your questions and we will try to deal with them uh, without Andrew. So Andrew, we might include you in some sort of chats or debates uh, if we need your, your uh, response. Thank you so much for joining.